now that we talked about in our previous chapter, we, we reviewed sequences of series, and then we introduced the concept of convergence and divergence of a series, and we ran through a whole bunch of different tests that we can use to determine if a series converges or diverges. Now we're going to look at a specific kind of series in this section called a power series. And a power series is a kind of series that has uh, variables in the terms. And you can really, when you look at it, you can think of it as an infinite polynomial. Okay, so when we look at it, the CNs are just constants, and that's based on our um, N here. And in this case right here, this is where it's centered at x equals zero. So think about when we talked about graph shifting a long, long time ago in college algebra, and when we shift horizontally from zero, we add or subtract something from our x value. So when we shift and we come away from zero, we're gonna add or subtract something from the x, and then it's no longer gonna be centered at zero here. So when we look at it in terms of the idea of like shifting and no longer being centered at zero, our new center is gonna be this, our a. Now let's talk about the convergence of a power series. Now because the terms in a power series involve a variable x, the series may converge for certain values of x and diverge for others. But what's gonna happen in any case, the, the series is always gonna converge at the value of the center. Now, there are three properties for the power series for convergence, and only one is gonna hold true for each series, okay? So, property one, the series converges at just the center and diverges everywhere else for every other value of x. Okay, so this is always going to be true in any of these other two properties, okay? The series converges for all real numbers of x, so that would include our center, okay? The third option would be there's an interval. We have a radius of convergence, which we call capital R, and the series would converge on that interval, and that interval is going to contain the center. And then everywhere else outside that interval, it will diverge. Okay, so each series is going to follow one of these properties, and exactly one. So um, here in this definition, we have consider the power series given by this general format. The set of all real numbers x is where the series converges is called the interval of convergence, which we just kind of talked about that a little bit in this uh, third property here. Um, and if that happens, there exists a real number greater than r, that r we call the radius of convergence, and if the absolute value from x minus a is less than that r, then it's going to converge and it's going to diverge everywhere else outside that interval. Um, and then if the series converges only at x equals a, we say that the radius of convergence is zero. There's no length to it. It's just at one point. If the series converges for all real numbers x, then we say the radius of convergence is infinity. Which is at just that one point, that means the radius of convergence is gonna be zero. It's gonna diverge everywhere else. There's no interval here to say that it has some kind of a radius, okay? If it converges on all real numbers, that's this picture here, where we say the radius of convergence is infinity. And then if it has a specific interval where A is the center and we come out a distance of R on either side, on that interval here, we would say it converges and then it diverges everywhere else. Okay, so these are the three um, situations that you could have. Let's look at this example here where we're finding the interval of radius of convergence. 
and we have three parts to this. So I guess we're really doing three examples. Okay, so we have for part A, we have the series from n equals zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. Now, because we don't have an x minus some value inside parentheses raised to the power of n, it's not like x minus five or something like that. We know that a here is gonna be zero. Okay, and then that constant that's in front, if we go back up and look at what the definition looks like for a power series. Okay, so the constant is what we're calling the CN. That's the part without the X. So when we come back down to our example here, the part without the X is gonna be one over N factorial. That's our constant. Okay, so we're gonna check to see um, where this converges, and we're going to use the ratio test to do that. So the ratio test tells us that we take the nth plus one term, and we divide by the nth term, and then we find the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of that expression, and it converges when that limit is less than one. When I put the n plus one term, over the nth term and I take the absolute value and find the limit. I'm gonna do a flip and multiply here and then I'm gonna clean it up. I have one more x up top than I do on the bottom. So everything cancels except for one x on top. When I factor out my factorials, I can rewrite this factorial as n plus one times n factorial and then the n factorials cancel. So what I'm left with downstairs is the n plus one. Now, I know that my n's are all positive because we're talking about um, going, starting from zero or one and going to positive infinity. So I don't have to worry about keeping the n plus one inside the absolute value. So I'm just gonna take the absolute value of x over n plus one. Now, as n goes to infinity, this whole thing gets smaller and smaller and smaller, no matter what the value of x is. This is gonna get so big that this fraction, whole fraction is gonna to go to zero. So no matter what this value of x is, this is going to go to zero. So it doesn't matter what the value of x is, this is always going to converge because if this is zero and it's less than one, the ratio test says this converges. So no matter what the value of x is, the series converges, which means that this is gonna converge for all real numbers. So my interval of convergence is gonna be from minus infinity to positive infinity, and I would say that the radius of convergence is infinity. If we look back up here real quick at our definition, just a quick refresher, Right, it says what the radius is convergent, what the radius of convergence is for each case. So when we have, if the series converges for all real numbers, we say that the radius of convergence is infinity. Okay, so that's this case here. So no matter what I plug in for X here, this is always going to converge. At part B here, we have the series from n to infinity of x to the n times n factorial. So again, our center is gonna be zero and our constant Cn is gonna be n factorial. So we're gonna check for convergence using the ratio test. So I'm gonna take the absolute value of the nth plus one term over the nth term and find the limit as n goes to infinity. So here's our nth plus one term over our nth term. Now, when we clean this up, I have one extra x on top compared to the bottom, so I'm left with an x in the numerator. And when I factor and cancel my factorials, I'm left with an n plus one in the numerator. And so from here, what I'm gonna do is, since we know n plus one is gonna be positive, I'm gonna take that outside of my absolute value. So I'm left with the absolute value of x times n plus one, and we're gonna take the limit as n goes to infinity. Well, unless x is equal to zero, this is always going to diverge. 
because this is going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. If x is 0, however, then all the terms will be 0, 0, 0, 0, right? And as you take the limit, it's going to approach 0. So this series is going to diverge for all values of x that are not equal to 0. This series is going to converge only when x is 0, meaning only at the center, okay? And then that means our radius of convergence is 0. If we look back at our definition and our pictures up here, if it only converges at that one point at the center and it diverges everywhere else, that's the case when we say the radius is zero and the series only converges at the center. Looking at part C, we have the series as n goes from zero to infinity of x minus two raised to the n over n plus one times three to the nth. If you notice here, our center is 2, it's not 0, as in the other uh, two examples. Um, and our constant is 1 over n plus 1 times 3 to the n, all in the denominator. So we're going to use the ratio test to check for convergence. So we're going to take the nth plus 1 term over the nth term here, find the absolute value, and take the limit as n goes to infinity. Then we're going to do a flip and multiply to clean this up. I have x minus 2 raised to the n plus 1, and I have x minus 2 to the nth down here. That means I have one more up here than I do downstairs. So I'm going to be left with an x minus 2 upstairs. That's this one right here. Now I have a 3n plus 1 here and a 3n here. So I have one more 3 in the denominator than I do in the numerator, so I'm left with the 3 downstairs. And then, of course, the n plus 2 and the n plus 1, we can't do anything with that, so we just carry it down. So after we cancel out everything that we can possibly cancel, this is what we're left with. Okay, and then if we pull out, because we know the ends are going to be positive, so if we pull out the x minus 2, I have the absolute value of x minus 2 times n plus 1 over 3 times n plus 2, and that's going to give me, when I take the limit as n goes to infinity, that's going to give me 1 third times the absolute value of x minus 2. So, we know that the series converges when this limit is less than 1 based on the ratio test. We also know, based on the ratio test, when this is equivalent to 1, it's unclear if it converges or not. So what we're going to do is we're going to find where this is less than 1, and then we're going to check the endpoints where it's equal to 1, we're going to check the endpoints of that interval separately. Okay, so the series converges when the limit from the ratio test is less than 1. When I set this limit that we got up here less than 1 and I solve for x to find out what that is, um, I go through and I multiply both sides by 3 here. So I get the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 3. Then to remove the absolute values, I have to put x minus 2 between negative 3 and 3. So this tells me when I finish solving for x that the series is definitely going to converge between negative 1 and 5. But again, because the ratio test tells us that the test is unclear when the limit is equal to 1, we have to check these values separately. So now, checking the endpoints. If I check when x is equal to negative 1 and I plug that in, so I plug in um, negative 1 here for x, I get minus 1 minus 2, which gives me a 3 to the n. So then I can get rid of the 3 to the n's and just leave negative 1 to the nth, okay? And so when we um, simplify this and we're left with the alternating harmonic series, 
and we know that that converges. Okay, so we know that then at x equals negative 1, the series converges. When we check it at 5, so I plug in 5 for x, I get 5 minus 2, which gives me 3 to the n over 3 to the n. I can get rid of the 3s to the n's, and I simplify it, and I get from 0 to infinity of 1 over n plus 1. That is the harmonic series, and we know for sure that that diverges. So now, after checking the endpoints, we know for sure, based on the ratio test, that it converges between negative 1 and 5. But when we check the endpoints, we see that it also converges at negative 1. So we can state that the interval of convergence is bracket negative 1, including negative 1, up to 5, not including 5 going to look at how to represent functions as power series and we're going to do this by taking a look at the geometric series. So if we think about this geometric ser series here which we should be familiar with at this point um, and we know that it only converges when that common ratio when the absolute value I should say of that common ratio is less than one then we know that it converges to whatever the value of a is over 1 minus r. And so therefore we can write it as an infinite polynomial function. So instead of using a's and r's, we're going to use x's. So if I rewrite it in terms of x's to think of it as an infinite polynomial, and if I know that that x is less than, or the I should say the absolute value of that x is less than one, then I know that when I add all this up, it's gonna be equal to one over one minus x. So let's look at graphically what this looks like. Okay, so if I start looking at the partial sums, and in this graph that I got from the book, they're using the partial sums 2, 4, and 6. If I take this function, okay, and I find the partial sums, okay, so S2 would be if I plug in the value for 0, 1, and 2. So I'm adding up all the terms for n is 0, 1, and 2. That's going to give me this, okay? And when I look at S2 on here, that's what this is going to look like graphed. Now when I look at S4, it's going to go all the way out to x to the fourth because I'm going to add all the terms for n is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then the same thing goes for 6. Now, when we start looking at the graphs of these partial sums, you can see that it's getting closer and closer to the function 1 over 1 minus x. And it's only going to do that on the interval when x is between negative 1 and 1. Okay, so you can see what that looks like graphically. Now let's look to see how we can represent a function with the power series. Okay, we're going to use a power series to represent each of the following functions, and we're going to find the interval of convergence. So we need to rewrite this in a way that looks like a over 1 minus r. Okay, so if I rewrite this so that I have a minus and a minus here, a 1 minus a negative x to the third, I can say that a is 1 and negative x to the third is r. If I look at it in terms of the convergence of a geometric series. So that means I can rewrite this here as... 1 plus, this is my r, r to the first, negative x to the third to the first, plus negative x to the third squared, plus negative x to the third to the third, etc. And then when we simplify this with our negatives in our exponents, we get 1 minus x to the third plus x to the sixth minus x to the ninth. And we can say that that's equal to when we write it as an infinite polynomial like that, we can say that that's equal to 1 over 1 minus negative x to the third when x, the absolute value of x is less than 1. And then here's how we would write it as a series. My a is 1, so that goes in front here, 1, Look, thinking about it in terms of the geometric series. 
And then my common ratio, in this case my r, would be the negative x to the third. So this is how we would write it as an infinite series. So this is going to converge when the absolute value of my common ratio is less than 1. So to remove the absolute values, I'm going to get rid of this negative, and I'm going to say that the x to the third is going to fall between negative 1 and 1. And when I take the cubed root of each of these terms, that's going to give me that x falls between negative 1 and 1. Um, and so therefore, 1 over 1 plus x to the third, that's this what we started with here, is going to be equal to this infinite polynomial, and it converges when x is on the interval between negative 1 and 1. And because we're comparing this to a geometric series, remember, we're not going to worry about testing the endpoints here, because we know it only converges when the common ratio or the absolute value of the common ratio is strictly less than 1, not equal to 1. So we don't have to worry about checking those endpoints. Let's look at the second example for writing a function as a power series. Um, this function here, x squared over 4 minus x squared, doesn't quite look like the a over 1 minus r yet. But we're going to do a little bit of algebra manipulation to make it look like that so that we can write it as a power series. Okay, so to do that, I'm going to divide everything by 4. So I'm going to take x squared by 4. 4 over 4 is 1. And then I'm going to take x squared over 4 down here. So I divide the top and the bottom of this fraction by 4. So now I'm going to let this be a, and I'm going to let this be r, because now it's in the form of something over 1 minus your r, something else, okay? So this is my a, and this is my r. So if I think about writing it in terms of a geometric series, I would have my a times my r to the nth. And when we expand that, we would get x squared over 4 for n equals 0. For n equals 1, we would get x squared over 4 squared. For n equals 2, we would get x squared over 4 raised to the third, and then etc. And we could keep going out looking at all those terms. So this is only going to converge when the absolute value of x squared over 4 is less than 1. So when I do a little bit of manipulation with my algebra, I'm going to get that it converges when x is between negative 2 and 2, not including negative 2 and 2. So when we write this function here as a power series, we get this. Okay, and we can say that it converges between negative 2 and 2. Now, um, the advantage to doing this, rewriting functions as power series, is that if I expand and look at the terms of that power series, we're looking at something that's similar to just describing it as an infinite polynomial. So, if I have a really complicated function and I can rewrite it in terms of an infinite polynomial, it'll make it a lot easier to take the derivative or to integrate rather than dealing with the complicated function. So we use this idea as a tool to try to simplify a complicated function.